Hello, we're here with Kate Martin, who's running for Seattle City Council, position number eight. Uh, Kate, would you like to go ahead with your two minute introduction? Yeah, thank you very much, Nicole. Yes, uh, I'm challenging Teresa Mosqueda in position eight of the Seattle City Council. Um, I, I think Seattle needs a better government. Um, I've been paying attention for over 30 years. Um, and since we voted in district elections in 2013, I don't, I have noted that I do not think that our, um, that our position eight and nine um, council members are functioning in what we really hope to achieve with the um, district election. So I'm looking to um, do some, a little bit of reform on the roles of those um, positions. I bring a few things to the table that I think are important for this role. Um, the first thing I bring is uh, intellectual and political and professional diversity. I, I'm a planner um, and designer for my entire career and I'm uh, very good at uh, you know both identifying what a problem is and then being part of an analysis and solutions um, creating team to um, actually solve the problem at hand. Um, I bring, hopefully uh, I, mentioned a little a second ago, but I, what I plan to bring is democracy. Again, I do not believe that, um, that these two eight and nine positions are, are, are doing everything that we could really enjoy them doing. And um, what I picture happening with um, working with the other um, at-large uh, council member is to really go out there and be kind of the sh uh, shuttle um, diplomats between um, all of the committees and all of the council members and all the districts and, and the mayor's office. I, I think that um, what I'm seeing is uh, legislation without representation. And um, I think that's uh, not at all what we had in mind, but it's fixable um, if we define what those roles are and, um, and respect what we're trying to do with uh, changing to districts. Um, and then the um, third thing I bring to the table is my lived experience. I am 63 years old. I've been around the block a few times. Um, I have, um, as a planner and designer, I often pilot ideas. And so in terms of um, helping people out of tents and um, creating affordable housing, I, I live that dream um, at my own house that I share with uh, eight others, um, two who are um, transitioning out of tents and others that, of us that all live very um, affordably. So I'd like to bring my boots on the ground um, success with the models that I have already um, piloted rather than um, relying on some kind of uh, unproven theories or fi even failed theories that we're still relying on on that level. Uh, sorry, I went over, I wasn't even looking. Oh my gosh, sorry. I, I, can, I was just about I, to stop you. <laughs> oh, thank you. I just, thank you. I just, um, <laughs> I'll get that. I, I have it set up now where I can see it a little better and still look at you, so thank you. There you go. Um, so now we're going to move into the uh, first of the four prepared questions. The responses to these, again, are two minutes apiece. And uh, Layla, would you like to go ahead? What specific actions will you take to address the homelessness crisis in Seattle, both in the short term and long term? These address land use, zoning, revenue, regional collaboration, the role of social services, the role of the police, and the justice system. Okay, that's a that's fat. <laughs> okay, let me wrap my, my head around that. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to systematically be able to remember to hit all of those um, points, but I, I shall try. Um, yeah, so I, I like to um, really take a look at what we're, um, again, I'm like, what is what is the problem we're trying to solve? And it's easy to say, homelessness and then go into, we need to rezone the whole city and, and that's all gonna work, but we, we've already been around that block and um, that's not exactly the problem we're looking to solve. What we're dealing with, um, I'm out every Saturday working, cleaning, um, tidying up at encampments, meeting people, and obviously I'm bringing some of them home um, to transition them. Um, and I, I think what we're missing is, um, the people that are um, suffering in the tents are largely um, schizophrenics and um, people with bipolar so bad that they can't um, really function um, in, a, in jobs and normal things like that. They wind up living in cars and tents. Um, I think, you know, 40 years ago, we had in our state 7,000 um, residential facilities that were granted outdated at this point. We wouldn't be doing that again, but we're, we're about 14,000 um, supportive housing um, units um, short of 
uh, what we what we need considering our population has doubled. So I'm I'm looking for that, but I'm looking for it not so much. Let's warehouse everybody in a hotel um, or a tiny house camp, but let's kind of use the model that I did, where it's where um, supportive housing can just be in a nice small group where you have friends and family around you and you have. Um, mentors that help you um, get through your struggles, but I, I really think it's a, um, you know, mental health and let's just say um, bipolar and schizophrenia both are often overlaid with addiction. So we're, we're, we're needing to work with all those things, but I, I think it's uh, calling it a housing crisis is, is not, doesn't do justice. I do not believe to what we need to do. Um, I think that it's kind of interesting. Um, sometimes I'm digging through like, uh, you know, two feet deep garbage, um, needles, rats, all of that kind of thing in the encampments. I, I think that it's um, this whole idea of, uh, you know, harm reduction uh, is, is a false premise because the people are throwing bags of needles, but they're not asking anybody if they need help. They're not picking up the old needles. They're not helping clean up garbage. Um, public health has um, a lot of um, work to do. And so, um, myself, I, I want to get down to what the problem is, what I see on the ground every week when I'm out working, what I hear from the um, people that I'm helping with housing. And, and I think that um, th that way we're going to get to a solution. I'm sorry, again, Thank I don't you. have my time. We're going. That's okay. You I could can... just hold your finger up. Um, right. just, just, just like one, do Perfect. something. I don't know. Just, yeah. I don't mess you up. That's fine. Uh, let's see. Let's go into question number two. And I believe I had a. Uh, Katie, get me. Katie, go ahead. Yeah. Um, what is your strategy for creating dense and diverse neighborhoods and assuring affordable housing? How would you work to dismantle systemic racist arrangements, redlining, including, but not limited to exclusionary zoning and land use policies? Do you support and would you sponsor city legislation to end single family zoning as Berkeley, California recently did? Um, thank you for that. I'll start my timer. Um, I, I guess, uh, again, I have to go back to say what problem are we trying to solve? We've done a lot of rezoning in Seattle. I call it, um, you know, basically develop, developer oriented density. We, we had this battle cry housing for all. We did all this rezoning, but honestly, um, it, it's not, um, it's not what we actually need to do. What I want to do is single family zoning. And again, I live in a single family zone. We have like so many dwellers per acre in my home. It's a model that I believe in. We still have plenty of, it's a bucolic setting. We've got a lovely garden. We've got plenty of space for each other. So what I see um, as a really productive direction, again, I'm a planner and a designer. So this is kind of my bailiwick is to um, reframe single family housing and rename it to sustainable families and groups. And then um, honestly, if we had one house like mine um, every couple of blocks and we could incentivize that, maybe had an owner occupant as well as perhaps a on-site mentor for people to help them um, move forward, um, we could have this thing solved um, in no time. So, so I'm, I'm more for that. We have enough zoning for people for the next um, 25 years already on the books in Seattle, but as we've seen, um, it didn't lead to affordable housing. The grand bargain was really the most um, ridiculous redlining that I've um, ever seen in my career. Um, so again, it's uh, you know it's catering to Wall Street and um, not to Main Street in terms of that. And when it comes to social justice, there's two things that I think can move um, the equation. And one of them is owning land. Um, I think that that's um, all of our policies need to be moving towards getting people um, land. And I also think the other um, aspect of that is um, an education system that actually educates people. So, so, you know, I always say, what does the plantation look like today? You know, we, we can talk about what redlining was and thing. What does it look like today? How can we solve it today? And what we're seeing on the ground today, um, because we're, we're not addressing that at, at all. Great, thank you. Um, now we're going into question number three. And Sherry. Hi, uh, would you decrease the Seattle Police Department SPD budget, and if so, by approximately one percentage? And what is your plan for the, Seattle, for the city's SPOG negotiations? And do you support and will you advocate for ending qualified immunity for law enforcement? Okay, so we're talking about whether I support defund. 
And we're talking about whether I support um, qualified immunity or not. And what was the third one? With the Seattle Police Officers Guild negotiations, what's your plan for the negotiations? Okay, so um, let's see, get my timer back up so I don't, uh, my timer's off, just, sorry. Um, yeah, so the defund the police, um, it, it never really made sense to me because um, I'm, a, I'm not a, um, more of a course corrections person. And so I think it's um, really, um, you know, reform um, police. I think we've made a lot of progress in, um, in my lifetime. And so I'm always looking at the long view, what more can we do? So um, defunding the police, uh, no. I, I, we all see what's happening with crime and how um, you know, every single moment of every single day, there's something going on where people need help from the police. I think to a certain extent, we've um, scapegoated the public safety system, um, again, by not providing um, for the mentally ill and addicted and, um, and then just acting like um, the police are going to somehow magically make that happen. I think we need um, to address the mental illness and addiction and we need to have an awesome police force. So um, again, reforming what that looks like is, uh, is awesome. Defunding, um, no. So, uh, you know, even in my little uh, neck of the woods right here. I, I, I've needed to call the police when one of my um, housemates had a mental breakdown and pulled a gun and a knife on me. And they they responded so beautifully and they were so kind to the person who was having the breakdown and no one got hurt. And I, I was proud of my police force. So so I'm not a cop hater or, you know, like uh, all cops are bastards or any of that kind of um, Thing. I treat people, you know, um, on an individual basis. Um, you know, SPOG is a is a um, you know a, a, a very strong um, organization. Um, however, in the conversations I've had so far um, with Mike Solon and um, and that I would continue to have as a council member, I feel like we communicate well, and um, we have very reasonable exchange of ideas. Um, so I'm I'm feeling very positive about. Um, being able to have um, an awesome relationship with the police force that's not adversarial or not like, you know, let's spit on the cops or throw urine at them or everything that's happening out there um, to those men and women um, on the force. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I think um, we've come a long way with, um, you know, things that with qualified immunity, I, 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 I would like to do away with that. And I, I think that that can be um, we can negotiate that to to happen. Um, and I th there's lots of other um, changes we need to make as well. But I, I feel like, um, you know, course corrections, um, we don't need a revolution, we don't need to have um, no public safety. So, so, you know, that's the kind of person that you can expect me to be on the council. Great. Thank you. Um, and question number four. Uh, how will you prioritize transportation infrastructure for biking, pedestrian, public transit, commercial vehicles, and cars? Which do you view as most important to prioritize funds for? Yeah, that's a great question and thank you for it. So in 2009, I did a study, a large neighborhood matching fund project study where I figured out how we could finish the sidewalk infrastructure. Um, I met with blocks of people that wanted to move forward and we we figured out how to do it. And I, I believe it needs to be a matching fund program where people um, people can organize their blocks and get matching funds to finish the infrastructure on their street for um, what we call complete streets in my, uh, in my field. So um, I think it's, it's uh, awful for people um, in neighborhoods north of 85th and, um, and south of, of the, the former line of the city to not have um, safe places to walk, especially for the disabled and the young and the elderly. So I completely um, am behind that and I will bring um, a completed sidewalk system um, idea to the fore as a council member. Um, I think that um, transit, I'd love to see more buses um, connecting neighborhoods. Not everybody needs to go downtown and it's become really unwieldy to, to move around the city, especially in an east-west direction. So. I have some um, kind of fun ideas about connecting um, Lake Washington to Puget Sound with um, summer buses to get people to the parks. And um, I call it the beach bus. I think it'd be really fun. Um, 
commercial vehicles, um, you know, I sometimes I wonder if, um, and I don't mean just people that throw commercial plates on and want to cheat the system, but commercial vehicles, sometimes I wonder if they could um, share bus lanes to be able to move freight because um, when we can't move freight, we just um, can't, can't uh, keep everything running. So maybe there's something to do with that. I'd love less cars. Um, I also am really interested in um, how we use um, the right of way. We've got these 60 foot right of ways, but um, certainly the most important role for them cannot be the storage of vehicles. Um, so I'm, I'm quite interested in creative ways to make more livable streets. Great, thank you. So now I'll move into follow up questions. Um, and the responses to those are one minute a piece. Um, does anybody have a follow-up question? If so, raise your hand. I have a whole bunch of them, so. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Sherry. I always like to ask other people first. Um, a lot of members have submitted questions for, for candidates, so. Go ahead, Sherry. Hi, um, in, the, <clears throat> in your opening, you talked about reforming the district-wide position um, and you said they aren't, I think you said that they aren't uh, democratic or something. Right. I'd like you to uh, explain what you mean. Yeah, thank you. And I'll try and, uh, I think you said one minute, so I'll try and be brief. Um, the situation is, is that um, I think that um, the at-large positions should be perhaps at-large on all the committees and perhaps not actually have their own committees. What I am seeing is kind of a power struggle um, occurring where um, where the at large are, are kind of li literally at large in terms of like missing in action um, on the district level. And that's not what we intended. So when a committee forms, um, and I will do this, you can expect, um, you know, debate from me on every level. And then when a committee forms, and um, I'm going to say, are, do we have all the stakeholders at the table? Like currently, they have these renters commission, almost all the affordable housing in Seattle that's rented is coming from mom and pop landlords that are completely under pressure um, to fold because of um, they, they were never at the table when the legislation was made. So I call it legislation without representation, which is not democratic. Um, I think that I can play a very strong role in position eight to, like I said, be the shuttle diplomat that is making sure I'm getting ideas from the districts up into council chambers and getting what's happening in council chambers back out to the voters so they actually know what's going on because right now people really don't know. They the committees are stacked without being having all the stakeholders and and I think that's very unfortunate, but it is fixable. Great. Thank you. Um, Kate, one of the questions that came forward was um, uh, Reese or in the past you you have not interviewed with the 36 district Democrats. I know um, you've filed for office before and, um, and, and recently, um, I think someone said that there was a recent announcement that you were actually Republican. So I just want to go ahead and sort of like address the, the, the elephant in the room, so to say. Sure. <laughs> Do you yeah. want to go ahead and take a minute for that? C certainly, I'll mm -hmm. try and cover that in a minute. So um, what I found, I've been, uh, you know, I was treasurer of the Metropolitan Democratic Club. I've been, I was a member of the 36 for a long time, but um, I started to see um, policies that were too socialist. I, I'm against socialism. Um, I'm all for social democracy, but um, I saw kind of a shifting when Chong Sawant came in that they were supporting more communist and socialist policies. And I'm against that. Um, and I, I felt it at the 36. So I decided to become nonpartisan in 2016. I was treated very badly by the 36th in my interview for the initiative that I had on the ballot. Um, it was very disappointing. They treated me well when I ran for school board in 11, but things were so different back in 11 than they are right now. Um, I, I went nonpartisan. I became um, you know, nonpartisan completely from 2016 to 2020. Um, again, because I, I felt I feel like the swamp is bipartisan um, as far as the extremists and the parties that are kind of getting um, being the loudest voices in the room. I briefly um, flirted with being a Republican for about three months last year. Um, and then again, I was horrified by their behavior. Um, but I, again, I'm, it's not like I'm not horrified by some of the behavior um, on the 
left as well. So I'm kind of settled into considering myself a, a centrist um, Democrat. I know there's not much room in the tent for us, but um, that's who I am. And really that's who I've always been until I kind of, kind of got shoved out. Got it, thank you. Thank you for addressing that. Um, let's see here. And then I'm, we have time for one question, one more question. Unfortunately, we kind of went through our time really fast. Uh, let's see here. The one that's been asked is uh, our environmental community. Um, they would like to know how you would use your office to address climate justice um, and ensuring a healthy environment and access to climate supporting solutions. Um, such as like multimodal clean transportation options? Yeah, I think we're in a very strange place in terms of um, energy and how do we get green really, um, much stronger green situation in terms of battling climate change. So, you know, we get, we have this false sense of um, clean energy in Washington state because of the hydropower. We, you know, we're, we're, it's theoretically green, but when you see the environmental damage um, occurring from that system that's um, ending the salmon runs and leaving no food for whales, and um, but yet we pat ourselves on the back and say, aren't we great, we have this green energy. So that is something we have to address. I, going forward in the future, I'm not sure it's solar and wind. I, the transmission needs for that are um, staggering. The battery, um, the environmental cost of the batteries that are needed to run those systems are um, you know, scary. Um, my son's a solar um, rooftop uh, commercial electrician in IBEW. And, you know, we talk about this all the time. I think we're in just a weird in-between spot where we don't have the right energy sources that we need. Um, in the future, I could see, um, you know, I think hydrogen will come on um, board and become practical. And I think that small modular nuclear will come on and, and, um, and that will replace kind of where we are right now. And that will, the, both of those will be quite green. So, that's where I see us going with it. Um, again, I'm a landscape architect um, by training, and I've been, um, you know, environmentally um, involved my my whole life. Um, so I, you can expect me to um, again I bring the debate to the table, not just tow the tow whatever um, line is being presented, so we can make real uh, long term systemic change um, to bring a greener future and to halt the um, rate of climate change that we're experiencing. Great, thank you so much. And with that, we're gonna go ahead and ask you for a one minute wrap up. Okay, so thank you for this interview. These are great questions and I feel like we've got to cover um, a number of things. Um, again, I'm looking to bring um, intellectual diversity and um, political diversity um, and other kinds of diversity to the council so that we can we can have meaningful um, debates. I've been, um, you know, kind of a, a policy wonk pretty much my entire life. And I have uh, the, um, you know, content knowledge to be useful um, on the council to bring us uh, ideas that work. Um, you know, I, 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 I wanna bring us that democracy that we wanted um, when we voted in district elections. And again, we argued over with these two at large, should we have them, should we not have them? Um, so we have them, but they're not working properly. So um, I'm going to bring that. And then I've got these 63 years of lived experience that, um, that, that, that I think is quite valuable. You know, the French say, if you're not a communist when you're 20, there's something wrong with you. If you're still a communist when you're 30, there's something wrong with you. And so I think we're, we're kind of need to balance, um, you know, experience a little bit in that equation so that we're just not all caught up in the 20 to 30. Um, viewpoint. Um, and I respect the 20 to 30s, but I think we have to balance that. And um, I'm going to bring that balance to the table. If you want to learn more about the things that I care about, um, the seattlejournal.com is a magazine that I curate articles. I write a few of them, but mostly I curate from other sources. You can learn about what's important to me. Um, my website, electkatemartin.com, has my positions on um, all of the big issues um, in very brief format. So um, you can check that out. My telephone number is 206-579-3703. I pick up and I'm very interested in, um, in having as many conversations as possible to form my um, positions and opinions. So I look forward to hearing from people in the 36th. I live right here in the 36th and I, um, I can't wait to talk to you. So thank you for this opportunity this morning. Um, I appreciate it and, and uh, 
great for you. Thank you so much. And I'm going to stop this recording.